Hey everybody, welcome back as we continue our journey through the book of Luke. And today our lesson is called Followed, session nine uh, of this quarter's curriculum. And we're going to be talking about the first disciples of Christ. Now, Jesus used ordinary people with diverse backgrounds in his work. If you just look at the list of disciples, you got to realize and understand they had some interesting conversations around the, the campfire at night. You had a tax collector who was considered a traitor to Israel. And then you had Simon the Zealot, who was a person trying to overthrow the Roman government uh, to, to establish Israel back as an independent nation. You had those two guys sitting around a campfire, not to mention fishermen and a wide variety of other people. Judas, matter of fact, when you look at Judas Iscariot, he looked like one of those guys that just kind of blended in the middle and no one expected him to be the traitor. They would have expected Matthew, or they would have expected uh, uh, the zealot, right? Because it didn't, go, didn't line. So you have people on both ends of the spectrum, all right? But we're going to talk about Matthew today. We're going to talk about Peter, James, and John. Uh, and as we look in this, we're going to be covering Luke chapter 5. And we're going to jump around in this chapter a little bit. We're going to cover verses 4 through 11 first, and then we're going to jump to verse 27 through 32. So as we get started, make sure you have your Bible. Make sure you have something to write on. And something to write with. So if you need a pause, go grab that and come back. We'll get started. All right. So how has time changed some of the people you know from your childhood? Matter of fact, let's look at it this way. When you were in high school, uh, they gave out the titles, right? Most likely to blank. Most likely to succeed. Most likely to... I don't know, be a athlete, uh, professional athlete, most likely to go to jail. I don't know what titles there are. But if you look back and think on your high school, think about when you were younger, and you look back and say, man, my best friend, th he was most likely to do this. But now when we look on social media and we see him doing this, man, we didn't expect that, right? I want you to pause and I want you to think about just reflect where are those people that you can see on social media so e easily right now? Where do you see those people? Jot down some names and you're like, this is what we expected of them. This is what the hopes were. This is what their dreams were because we talked about it. And then this is where they are now. Could be better. Could be worse. Could be exactly where they thought they would be. Uh, you know, it's funny how um, all out of all my friends, the one that went the ministry was the one we did not expect to go into the ministry. Right. Uh, the ones that 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 are out thriving, we look back and like, man, how in the world did that happen? Uh, and then some other people right down the middle of the line. Right. They set out. This is what I want to do. That's what they have done. And uh, it's just amazing. You look back and see kind of where they are on that. All right. So once you look back and reflect on that for just a minute and we'll get started. But here's the question. How has time changed some of the people you knew in your childhood and what surprises you most? about these changes. All right. So last week we talked about Jesus in his hometown, all right? We just reminisced about our hometowns and, and people we knew. Jesus in his hometown, and then after he left, he went to Capernaum. Now, he had two different reactions in those. First off, Nazareth kind of rejected him, which which Scripture even says, right? There is, there is no, a prophet has no honor in his hometown. He goes to Capernaum, and all of a sudden, miracles start happening. And and um, as these miracles start happening, he starts getting a following. So he doesn't immediately go out and just start picking people to be his disciples. But in the midst of conversations, in the midst of uh, of reaching out uh, and and having these conversations and these miracles in this area, he finally sits in and says hey, these are who my disciples are. And he starts inviting people to come along and be a part of them. Now, let's quickly describe what is a disciple, right? As he began his ministry, uh, Jesus began to call individuals to walk with him, right? Now, we talk nowadays about doing a spiritual journey or a spiritual walk with us. But back then in Jesus' day, it was a literal, come walk with me. Uh, and the followers, his these followers, his disciples, would be with him over the course of three years. They would learn and just sit at the master's feet. And while they did not realize it at that time, they were being mentored to replicate his work after he left. 
And to encourage these disciples, Jesus performed a miracle that demonstrated both his provision and his authority. Now, none of these men were perfect, they were willing, but they were willing to leave their comforts, comfort zones, and surrender to the Savior. So they were open to leaving their jobs as fishermen to become fisher of men, and they were going to be God's instruments to bring many people to eternal life. Okay? So he didn't necessarily just look at them and say, man, these guys have great potential. What he was looking for was an obedient heart. And this is where we find ourselves uh, as we look at the disciples. Okay? So Luke chapter 5, verse 4 through 11. I want you to observe Peter's response to Jesus as I read the scripture, okay? Uh, look how Peter responds. And then, uh, even though they discuss Peter more often than the other disciples with him, James and John were here, okay? So focus on that as I read. Now, Luke chapter 5, verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled for their partners in the other boat to come over and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, uh, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, John, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. So as we look at this story, I want you to go down, and I want you to just kind of look through chronologically. Just jot down some notes, and I want you to think in your head, what's the order of the events that took place? And what sticks out most to you, okay? And as you're writing down, just kind of skim back over it, read it for yourself again. And then just by memory, just say, hey, this is what happened. They put out their nets, they caught fish, just like that. And just say, what, what, what was the aspect of this story that jumped out at you the most? Do that, come back, and we'll, I'll pick up with a little more commentary on it, okay? All right, as I look at this passage, and I just go down looking what happened. Uh, he finished speaking, right? Jesus is teaching, he's talking, and he looks at Simon, and he says, put out into the deep water. Now, a couple of things I know in the background. So if you're teaching this lesson, here's a couple of little snippets for you, okay? Make you look like you've done your research. But no, just a couple of things about this. Uh, it highlights in the lesson plan that when he says put out in the deep water, night fishermen fished in the shallows, but the fish stayed in deeper water, deeper, cooler water during the day. Okay, so during the daytime, they had nets. This is another thing I learned in seminary. And it was fascinating because they said people still fish like this on the Galilean Sea even today. Is that during daytime, they have nets they drop down that are real thin, almost like fishing lines. So the fish can't see them. So they'll go fish out in the deep water, drop the lines, and this fish swim by, they'll get stuck in a net. Well, at nighttime, they use a thicker net. So it's, it's thicker net, and you don't use it during the daytime because the fish can see it, obviously. But they fish in the shallows because they're coming up trying to eat little, little things along the way. So Peter has been fishing probably the day before and didn't have a good catch, so he decided he was going to fish during the night as well. So he has his nighttime nets in the shallows right now. And he's cleaning and mending, and Jesus walks by, and he says, Yeah, you can use my boat. Jesus commands him, Go out to the deep water. Go out to the deep water and let down your nets. Now, first off, first thing going through Peter's mind, this guy has no clue what he's talking about. He's never fished on the sea before. I'm the professional here, not him. Right? So he takes his nighttime nets and goes out into the daytime spot to go fishing, knowing I've caught nothing all night. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. But because you ask, I'll go and do it. So... Uh, matter of fact, look at verse five, master Simon, we, uh, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing, but if you say so, I'll let down the nets. So what you see here is the obedience of Peter. Hey, Jesus came, he's preached, he's talked. I've heard him several times in this area. And just cause you ask, I'll do it. One, cause I don't want to embarrass you. Two, I don't want to call out in front of you. You have no idea what you're doing, but 
I'm just going to be obedient because you're talking like you have authority. So I'm just going to submit to you. And I'm going to be obedient and do what, do what you did. Do what you asked. So when they did this, they caught a great number of fish. Now, if you read in the book of John at the end, when, they, when this miracle happens a second time, you see John starts numbering the fish. Now, that's because John's a fisherman, and it's important to count the fish, right? Uh, but here, they just said it was so full, he had to call his partners over. Who's James and John? Come over. Using the wrong nets, fishing in the wrong part of the lake with those nets, they catch more fish than they've ever caught before. Their boats are full. Both boats are full. The nets are breaking. The boats begin to sink. And as they're pulling back in, this is the last you hear of the fish and how great of a catch it was. You understand that? The importance here is not how many fish they caught. The importance isn't that this is the greatest catch these men have ever caught. Their lives have been changed forever because of this catch and their profession. This will be one of those stories that will go on and on because Peter, James, and John had up two boats that sank using the wrong nets, fishing in the wrong part. Don't think people aren't going to try the next day. Hey, let's take the wrong nets out and see what happens. Right? These are the legendary stories that's going to take place. But in the passage here, what, they, what Peter understands is, this is no longer about the fish anymore. This is no longer about fishing. So as he comes down, they signal their partners when they get here, when they get to the shore. Simon Peter saw this and he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me for I am a sinful man, Lord. All of a sudden Peter realizes what just happened here is a miracle. What just happened here is something way beyond anything ordinary. Only someone that has extraordinary power that can do this. And I don't deserve to be in his presence. And he humbles himself and he presents himself before Jesus and says, I am just a sinful man. I'm just a normal fisherman. Why are you having anything to do with me? Please go away. And Jesus says, right? Or actually in verse 9, it says, For all those with him were amazed. All of them were amazed. Now, remember I said at the beginning of Luke, if you look through and you start reading through and you see miracles, what you're going to start seeing is, is that all the people were amazed. All the people were amazed. Here's another, another case. They were amazed is what just had taken place. So James and John, and so were James and John Zebedee's son, who were Simon's partners. And he said, don't be afraid. The same thing he said when he's walking on water, don't be afraid. The same thing he said uh, from time from time to time. He looks at him and says, hey, look, guys, don't be afraid. When he comes back to life, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because from now on, I'm going to show you how we're going to do things different. And we're going to catch people, right? So as we go down, as we look at this, just how Simon Peter's life has been changed because of this one fishing episode. Verse 11, then they brought their boats to land left everything and followed him. Now, in another passage in Matthew, I believe, it says that, and James and John left their father Zebedee and the servants in the boat. So here's what you see is that when they came to leave, they didn't worry about the fish. They didn't worry about mending their nets. And they didn't worry about their boats they almost lost. They left that in charge of the other people that were still there. But they left everything and followed Jesus. Okay? So how... Do you ever wonder what Peter may have thought, reflecting back as an older man, maybe in prison, thinking, man, what would have happened if I chose the fish over Jesus that day? What would have happened if I refused and Jesus, and I said, Jesus, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, and I let Jesus walk away? Jesus gave a challenge, and I just said, no, I can't do that. That's not me. I'm not worthy enough. Or, or do you see this catch I just, we just got? I got to sit here and clean these fish. Do you ever think he reflects back on that and thinks, man, that day changed my life. And I'm so glad I left the boat behind to follow Jesus. So, so how was God's grace and mercy demonstrated to Peter and the other fishermen? And, and how is that same grace and mercy extended to us today? Secondly, let's, let's look at the other side of that. Why is it important for a person to realize his or her sinfulness? And how does doing so open the door for God to work? Here in this context, we have those, both those questions that, that we see. You have Peter who says, go away from me for I'm a sinner. But you have Jesus showing grace and mercy. So, so I want you to think about this. And if you're watching this with someone, I want you to ask these questions and discuss it. 
How is God's grace and mercy demonstrated to Peter and the other fishermen? And how is that same grace extended to us? But why is it important for us to realize his or her sinfulness? Why is it important for us to realize our sinfulness in the process? And how does that open the door for us, for God to work in our life when we recognize our sin? Y'all go discuss that, come back, and we'll carry on. All right. First off, I think, as, as you know, if you know the ABCs of the gospel presentation, you must admit that you're a sinner. You must believe in Jesus and you must uh, commit to Jesus, right? So A is admit. So I think it's very important for us to humble ourselves and admit that we cannot do it on our own. We are sinful people, just like Peter did. And know that when we admit that we're a sinner, Jesus is right there waiting as because he has already extended that grace and mercy to us. And by admitting that we're a sinner, we're in a position to receive that grace and mercy. And Jesus still offers that same grace and mercy to us pre-salvation, in salvation, and beyond salvation. Because it's that grace and mercy that gets us to the point of salvation, that, that you know we have to recognize it. And then when we become saved, it's that same grace and mercy that sustains us through because Jesus sustains us through everything. He forgave us of all of our sin. And because of that, his grace and mercy continues on and on and on. And we continue to admit that we're a sinner to keep that humble relationship as we go forward. So it's important for salvation. It's important for our walk with God, our relationship with God as well. So now let's jump back in. Remember, at the end of verse, uh, at the end of the section, they brought their boats to land, left everything, and they followed him. So now as we look, they left their whole business behind, right, to start a new adventure. These three are going to be the elite disciples is what I would call them. It's James, John, and Peter. When he goes into the garden to pray, he takes those three. When he goes to transfiguration, he takes those three. So these are going to be the leaders of the disciples. So now let's look ahead in verse 27 through 28. Real quick, what happens in between here is in verse 12 through 6, 16, a leper gets healed, right? Someone who is an untouchable in society. Don't touch one. They're unclean. Cast them out. Jesus touches that, touches them and heals them. In verses 17 through 26, friends bring a guy forward or a, a paralytic gets healed and Jesus forgives them of the sins and the Pharisees get the robes a little ruffled there. How dare this man forgive their sins? But to show that he had, had the authority to forgive sins, he healed this man, and he gets up and he walks. So now we come to this section in verse 27. And as we look through this, I want you to look for who's in the story, what takes place, where does it take place, and how and when. How and when. Okay, there are the questions. Who, what, where, how, and when does this all take place in the passage? And this was after Jesus healed those, the leper and the paralytic, okay? So that's the after this part in verse 27. So verse 27, after this, after healing the paralytic, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. So, so a couple of things you need to know is, is that one, tax collectors, as I mentioned earlier, they're the enemy of Israel. They're the traitors. They decided that they would side with Rome instead of Israel. And they're going to collect taxes for Rome and not Israel. So all the Israelites looked at them as one, unclean. They looked at them more as Gentiles, but not just Gentiles. Israelites that betrayed Israel and became Gentiles, right? So the Israelites don't like them at all. They're outcast. They don't want anything to do with them. So, of course, tax collectors on the flip side, trying to earn a living, realize they're hated by everyone, then they start collecting more and more taxes and pad their pockets with it. And they become wealthy people. It says, at least if I'm going to be miserable living among these people that hate me, might as well be wealthy about it, all right? So, so Levi is sitting at what we would call his boat. He's sitting at the tax collector's office. And as he's sitting there, he must have heard what's going on with Jesus. He must have been hearing about the ripple effects that take place in, in, in this society. Hey, did you hear about the guy that had the great catch of fish? Hey, did you hear about the guy that got healed? Did you hear about the leper that, that was healed as well? And you hear these stories, and they're having this conver these conversations that go on all through this town and community. Well, it makes it to the tax collector's booth as well. And they're having these conversations, and then Jesus just walks up to Levi, to Matthew, and say, follow me. Matthew does the same exact thing. 
This is equivalent to his boat, his livelihood. He leaves everything behind. And he got up and began to follow him. He left, you know, just in the boat. They didn't care about the fish. Here, Matthew didn't care about the wealth. He didn't care about his position in society in the Roman government, not the Israeli government. But he didn't care about his position or his status at that time. He saw an opportunity, a, an opportunity that presented itself and said, I cannot let this pass by. The man that, that allowed those fish in the boat, the man that has healed this person, the leper, all these stories that I'm hearing, and he comes and he talks to me. Man, can you imagine the, just the shell, the hard shell of Levi just breaking at the time? And he just submits and says, I'll follow you. And he just leaves everything and follows him. So let me ask this question. What are some things that might hold a person back from following Jesus? What are some stigmas in societies? What are some things that may hold people back from following Jesus? And how does Jesus' invitation to follow him remove those potential barriers? Discuss that, write those down, and uh, we'll come back and we'll carry on in our conversation. All right. Now let's jump into verse 29. As we look at verse 29 uh, through 32, I want you to listen for various attitudes reflected by religious leaders in the passage, okay? What are the attitudes of the religious leaders, the people that should have known, the people should have recognized who Jesus was? All right. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet for him at the at his house. And now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were guests with them. But Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus replied to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay. So here as we look through this passage and as we dive in, to, to, to this passage here, what we see is Levi, well, well first off, in, in the notes here, it says Levi hosted a grand banquet. Now, when you eat a meal with someone, you're establishing a covenant relationship with them, right? So he has called Levi out, said, come and follow me. Levi does what comes natural in his society for him. Let me host a banquet for you because I want people to know I'm affiliated with you now. And so, so by doing that, he's setting a covenant up with Jesus. Little does he know, Jesus is establishing a covenant with Levi, with Matthew here, right? So, so he throws his banquet and he calls all his friends together because if you are making a stand and you're saying my life's about to change, let me tell you how my life's changed, right? You want to call all your friends and all the people you normally hang out with and make this declaration public. And as he comes, Levi, and I would look at this kind of in the same light of just what happens when we get baptized, right? When you get baptized, it's God's already coming and change your life and you baptize and you're sharing that with people in the church and you want your family and your friends to know that you've made a decision for Christ and you're showing an outward response for an inward change. Here, Levi is doing kind of the same symbolism here. This guy named Jesus came and told me to leave everything behind, follow him, and I've done that. I'm declaring to you that I am no longer the same Levi that you know. I am no longer the same Matthew that you know. You knew me as the tax collector. I'm letting you know now you can know me as the follower of Jesus. So he calls all his friends together. He calls uh, the tax collector, has this banquet at his house. And, and this is what I always find fascinating. And, and even in the commentary of this, it says tax collectors and sinners are always mentioned kind of together. It's almost like tax collectors, their own sin, right? He was eating and drinking with tax collect collectors and sinners. So who are these other sinners? And that could be anybody. It could be the politicians. It could be Romans. It could be uh, prostitutes. It could be anyone that's considered an outsider, an outcast from normal Israel uh, uh, society. But the Pharisees hear about this and come and like, why are you hanging out with not just the sinners, but the tax collectors as well, the traitors to Israel, what are you doing? So as he has this banquet, he says, why are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Why are you mixing the clean with the unclean? And they hear about this, and Jesus says, it's not those who are healthy that need a doctor, but those who are sick. Jesus goes not to those that think themselves righteous, but those that are unrighteous. 
He goes to the Peters that says, I'm an unclean man. Get away from me, Jesus. He goes to Levi, who's considered a traitor by his society. And he says, follow me. And Levi is desperate to have a type of relationship where he can just leave everything behind and start a new life completely. So who are the tax collectors and sinners in our culture today? And how are they excluded in our culture? I want you to think about that for a second. We're going to come back and discuss that, and then we'll wrap up, okay? So who are the tax collectors and the sinners in our culture today? I'm going to throw out some of these, and I just want you to think and ponder on it, because I don't know what your list is. I hope you've shared it with people around you. Let me show you it's just some of the lists that I come up with that I think sometimes we, we, we deem as uh, 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 stained with sin, okay? Maybe even beyond hope of salvation. If they walked in our church, we would be nervous, more nervous than maybe them, right? So addicts. I think a lot of times when we hear about people that have addictions, that we're just like, oh, well, you know, they just got that sin in their life and we, you know, and, and they choose that sin over everything else in their life. And I think sometimes we can kind of minimize it and push them to the side and just say they're not worth it. They're not worth it because it's going to take a lot of effort to get their life straight. Uh, I think sometimes when we look at people, how, how many times, and especially during this pandemic, I've seen a lot more of this just with our society and the, the economics of our time. What about people just sitting on the street corner with signs saying need food? Have we hardened our heart toward people like that as much? Um, or we just look at them and just say, you know, it's easy for us to say, why don't you just get a job? You know, uh, there are all kinds of resources out there. There's things you can do, even if it's just for minimum wage. Go go get a job, right? Why are you standing there holding a sign begging for money? And I think we can easily, not knowing their story, not knowing who they are, not knowing what they've been through, easily sit there and judge. Okay? What about unwed mothers? Uh, I think sometimes we put a stigma on that as, as people have made mistakes. People are, are, are sinners, right? But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we can't touch them. They're going to bring, bring, bring a bad reputation to our church. It may look like we're condoning the sin instead of convicting them of their sin or condemning them for their sin. And I think the church has taken some stance on that that's kind of said, you're not welcome here. When really, man, that's what I would call a modern day widow almost is that these are the people that can't help themselves and we can get nothing out of them. So that's pure religion. We need to show them the love of Christ because we know that honestly, they're prob probably not going to get much from them. But how much can they get from us in the love of God, right? How is Because it's not about what we can get. It's about what we give. All right, I'm going to throw this one out there and I think it's going to be a, um, a little more controversial. What about homosexuals, all right? Now, I know a lot of people are like, oh, you know, we, we accept everybody in our church. But what about if a, a known homosexual walks in our church? Are you going to treat and minister to them exactly the same as you would anyone else that walks through our church? Or do we get a little nervous about that? Because, well, you know, it's just they're, they're sinners. They're going against God's will. If you see someone out in our workplace or something like that, do we minister and treat them exactly the same way as we do any and everybody else? Or do we treat them different and single them out? Do we treat them as the tax collector of, of our day? I'll say this. I think if, if you are a homosexual, I think I would hope that if you come into our church, you would feel the love and acceptance that you would anywhere else. I know there's sin in your life. And I know that there's a lot to overcome in that sin. But can you imagine if a homosexual gets right with God? And, and comes to know Christ in a saving way, don't you think he would throw a banquet and say, let me tell you who I've just discovered, and I need to bring my friends together so they can hear about the love of Christ and how he's changed my life? But they never get that far, probably because, one, we tend to judge more than we accept. We tend to just already determine in our head they're not going to accept Christ before we ever just share with the love of Christ first and see what Christ can do in their life. Because I would like to, for them to sit back as they would get saved and look at it and say, all those that were with him were amazed at what Christ did in that situation. So let's look in our culture and make sure that we are not the Pharisees sitting back, looking at modern day tax collectors and sinners and judging them and say, how dare Jesus love on them? Because someone could have easily come to your banquet and said the same exact thing to you. How dare 
Jesus' love on Michael Blue. He doesn't deserve this. He's a sinner. Don't you know what he has done? And it can easily flip on us too. So don't sit back ready to throw stones when you've got plenty of stones that can be thrown at you as well, okay? Grace and mercy from Jesus. Grace and mercy from Jesus. No sin is too big that he can't forgive and that he can't change a person's life forever. All right? All right, so that's me preaching right there. Um, it is the duty of every child of God to win the lost for Christ. It is the duty of everybody's, uh, if you're a Christian, it's your job to go and share Christ with other people. Whether it's the tax collectors and the sinners, or whether it's just the family members that we know, I think as we look through this, as we look through this context, and you look at the diverse people that Jesus reached out to and said, follow me. I'll make you fisher of men. Follow me. Leave the taxes behind. And you'll just come and follow me and I'll show you, show you what God can do in your life. So here's, here's how I want to end this is, is how has God touched you in your heart today? I want you to reflect on your salvation. I want you to reflect on your salvation and how Christ has come in and changed you. And I want you to reflect on what would have happened that day that Jesus came and said, uh, I want to come in your life. And you sat back and said, no. How would your life be different? Secondly, I want you to realize that that opportunity could be coming this week to someone in your life. And you need to be ready to share how Christ has changed your life and that he can change their life as well. And right now, if I'm saying this and there's someone that needs to know Christ and, and you're thinking, you know, my neighbor, my coworker, my family member needs to know Christ. That's the Holy Spirit nudging you to go and talk to them. Let's not forget that, okay? So the people that God has placed in your heart, find a way to go share how Christ has changed your life and then extend the invitation that Jesus is willing to change their life as well. All right, God bless. Let's pray and we'll be just, we'll get out of here, okay? Dear God, I do thank you for today. I pray and ask, Father, that you watch over us and protect our heart and let us remember what it is to be saved so that we can go share Christ with others around us. But let us look out and let us uh, just be on the lookout for the tax collectors and sinners in our life. And let's act like you and not the Pharisees. Let us go and bring the love of Christ to them. In your name we pray and ask it. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a great day.